Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, Roe v. Wade. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. It's final. The Supreme Court today has struck down its own 1973 landmark ruling on Roe v. Wade. And not surprisingly, the decision pretty much mirrors the leaked draft originally authored by Associate Justice Samuel Alito. States with trigger laws blocking access to abortions and criminalizing those who help someone seeking access will soon be in effect. Women of color will be hit hardest by this ruling, as well as people in other marginalized groups, whose rights are now also potentially at risk. Will a return to abortion legislation regulated by the states undermine other legal protections for people of color? And what does a future without the constitutional protections Roe offered look like? Joining us remotely, Renee Landers, Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Health and Biomedical Law Concentration and the Masters of Science in Law Life Sciences Program at Suffolk University Law School in Boston. Chastity Bowick, Executive Director of the Transgender Emergency Fund of Massachusetts. Renee Graham, Associate Editor and Opinion Columnist for the Boston Globe's op-ed page and Yvonne Espinoza Madrigo, Executive Director for Lawyers for Civil Rights in Boston. Welcome to all. Now, I just want to start with you, Renee and Yvonne. Just let's look at the legally, exactly um, what the ruling says. Um, it looks like exactly what Alito wrote, but just to be clear. So, Renee, start us off. Landers. Right. So, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, I haven't had a chance to uh, read the entire thing yet, but I think that uh, the, the uh, summary that the court provided of the opinion indicates that the court has, held, uh, has overruled Roe v. Wade and the subsequent decision in Casey, uh, against Planned Parenthood, uh, which had established um, a constraint on the states in regulating abortion and saying that abortion could not be prohibited in the states until the point of viability, which right now under medical science is at about 23 weeks during, uh, of, of gestational age. So um, the, whole, um, the whole regime is, is, has been changed. I will point out that Chief Justice Roberts' concurrence uh, which was not necessary for the majority opinion, it just supplied the six vote, uh, would have um, uh, overturned the viability limit, but not, uh, but not have, uh, you know, overturned, uh, you know, the whole thing wholesale. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that he was still trying to uh, argue for a middle path, but this means that his influence on the court for that, these middle, uh, for judicial restraint, I think is very limited as evidenced by this opinion today. Okay, Yvonne, uh, Renee Landers was referencing the Dobbs case in Mississippi, which is what the case that led them. Um, they accepted the case, some said, uh, knowing that they wanted to, to uh, use a case to overturn Roe. So your response? It is, it is extremely uh, damaging and dangerous, the path that the court has uh, opted to follow here. Uh, this concept that fundamental rights, individual rights, need to be deeply rooted in history and tradition, where does that leave us? Um, Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973. Generations of Americans have lived with this as a, as a legal principle as a way to organize their day-to-day -day lives. Who is to say that Brown versus Board of Education from 1954 is deeply rooted, or the idea of interracial marriages, or uh, even LGBT equality? None of these things were written into the Constitution in the way the majority imply that is necessary for rights to be recognized, and that is appalling, simply appalling. So Renee Graham, so what Yvonne is saying is that um, this case is not just about Roe v. Wade or the Dobbs case in Mississippi, but actually looks at quote unquote settled law, supposedly settled law, and makes changes to it. And so therefore puts in, in the uh, crosshairs other cases uh, with similar kinds of rights. Well, I, you know, I think in the draft opinion, we heard the tell from Samuel Alito, 
when he said that abortion is not deeply rooted in the history of the United States. That was the hint of what's to come, because this isn't only going to be about abortion. It's going to be about uh, same-sex marriage. It can be about, uh, as, as Yvonne mentioned, um, Brown versus the Board of Education. It puts everything on the table. All rights are now under assault. And with this court and some of the decisions they've made, in this week alone, we can kind of see the pattern that rights will not be expected, that there will be these extreme right-wing decisions that will undermine laws. You know, the, the draft opinion that came out that leaked last month was like the warning of a, of a Category 5 hurricane. And now it's hit land. And it's going to upend this, this country like nothing I've ever seen in, in my lifetime. Chastity? Can I... Can I ch Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Go ahead. All right. I'm, I'm coming back around. I just want to get Chastity's yeah, no, take, right. initial take. Go ahead, Chastity. Um, you know, just hearing this this morning that it is now overturned, I feel as though that the rights of my community, the trans community, LGBTQIA plus community, um, our rights are now going to be up for discussion. Um, and that scares me. Um, and just like, you know, Who's to say what's going to be next? Is we're going? To, are we going back to segregation? Um, anything is up. For, everything is up in the air right now, and everything is up for grabs when it comes to our rights. So I'm just, I'm still a little speechless over here. Mm. So Renee Landers, I want, uh, I want you to pick up wh where you wanted to go, but I want to now put the emphasis on women of color and uh, uh, people of color and other marginalized groups and the impact of this overturning through that lens. So in your response, could you address that? Certainly. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to agree with Yvonne that um, I, I've never been a fan of the history and tradition test because it is a, it's a test that, um, you know, overvalues the past uh, and, and doesn't allow for uh, societal progress and, and, the and the evolution of the constitution to adapt to new understandings of what um, society should uh, be organized around. So, um, and then um, just in, uh, to Renee Graham's point, uh, the, um, just this week, um, the court decided, uh, you know, a case involving the right to the Miranda warnings, you know, when one is uh, detained and questioned by the police, where it kind of chipped away at that Miranda precedent. And the court sort of in, uh, in the Alito draft opinion relied heavily on, uh, you know, Miranda having overruled prior law. So I think that, um, you know, the sense of Renee and Yvonne that all rights are sort of, at, and, and chastity, that all rights are at risk is, is definitely correct. Um, with regard to um, the impact on uh, people of color, um, you know, the um, people of color disproportionately take advantage of the, the right to have access to abortion currently um, and for a whole lot of reasons, economic reasons, uh, lack of health care in many of these states that are restricting abortion rights, uh, lack of Medicaid coverage for low-income people in those same states. So this notion that um, this is a, a decision about respecting the health and uh, well-being of women and children or pregnant people and children is just not credible given the uh, you know current status of things. And so I think that um, people of color will have a significantly in the states with restrictive laws will have a significantly harder time take uh, gaining access to abortion rights because they will have to travel. Uh, they will uh, they just will perhaps not have the economic resources to take advantage of of the rights that ex may exist and be available in other states. Um, pick that up, Yvonne, uh, because when we talk about going back to the states regulating, now again through the lens of people of color, states' rights for a lot of us has been equated with, as Chastity said, segregation times. States' rights has never uh, been uh, 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 put black folks in a situation of feeling protected. Can you address that? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. It is, uh, it is inconsistent, right? The, the whole notion 
that the court can speak with one voice and be able to provide a definitive solution for these types of issues, that is a critical role. If you even think just a few years back when issues of same-sex marriage were being debated, in one state you were married, in another one you had no rights. And that inconsistency is very difficult to live with and to navigate. And the idea that you cross state lines and that that changes your entire legal identity. Um, so the, the issue here of returning things to the state, though that may make sense in some other contexts, in a particular context of fundamental rights, of individual rights, that certainly does not make sense because the consistency is what people need to rely on to organize their lives. I think the other issue here of how people of color are affected and not just by the deprivation of reproductive justice, but also the trickle effect that we're talking about in many different ways. Criminalization is already affecting our communities. Many of the, many of the provisions that are going to come into place are going to criminalize women. We don't know how this is going to manifest for people who cross state lines. Will we see scenes reminiscent of fugitive slave laws where people are being hauled back to their home state and in shackles? And are we going to see other cases going to the Supreme Court where the rights of people of color continue to be diluted? Texas has already announced that it's going to challenge the idea of undocumented children having access to public schools, a seminal case, Plyler v. Doe, which will certainly now be in the chopping block. And so the, the slippery slope here is dangerous because of criminalization and has collateral impact. Um, I want to pick up, Renee Graham, with the criminalization and what you have described as anti-women take um, on a lot of this legislation. And so when we start talking about criminalization and anti-woman take and reproductive, what some, some people call reproductive justice with regard to women of color and this ruling, uh, speak about what that impact really is. Well, the handwriting was, was already on the wall when states began to pass laws that said anyone could file suit against someone who had an abortion, whether you knew them or not, that if you'd heard about it, that you had a right to do that. So already we're looking at this idea of criminalizing what people can do, of really kind of minding other people's business. And so part of the idea of that is to terrorize people into not doing these things. The idea that, well, if I do this, I can get in trouble or a doctor can get in trouble. We've heard this as well in states that have been really hard on the trans community and the idea that doctors can be criminalized if they're giving gender affirming health care. You know, the, the idea is always based on punishment. As much as they want to talk about, you know, health care or taking care of women and babies, they don't care about that. What they care about is removing body autonomy from adults <laughs> and from people to make decisions that are best for their lives and their health. And so when you add an, an element of criminalization to that, that is a terrorizing effect. And I think that's a big part of what's going on in this as well. And now you're going to have, you know, literally millions of women trying to make these decisions that or what's best for their family, but also trying to keep themselves out of a legal system that seems rather e eager to sort of pull them into it. Mm -hmm. Chastity, you have uh, long talked about uh, in representing your community about the financial issues around just trying to ma maintain your personhood. Uh, and so here we have a situation that is definitely coming in with an extra financial burden on to begin with, black women who use 60% uh, of the abortions, that was the latest statistic um, in the country. Again, Renee Lander said there are many reasons for it, but in the trans community, your fear is that it now goes right at um, the kinds of health care concerns and needs that you absolutely have to have to live. Exactly, Callie. And Right now, like Yvonne said, it's for the trans community, it depends on what state you live in. So currently in Massachusetts, the rights that I have and access to health care, my trans sisters in Alabama don't have the same access. And so it's an uneven playing field. And that's what's 
scaring me the most that it's going to get worse because now what if they say it's like, okay, we're not producing hormone medications and it's illegal for providers to prescribe them. You think about somebody like myself who's been on hormone therapy now for over 12 years and what the effects of that is going to do to my body if I no longer have access to that medication. And then now do I have to go on the black market and try to search for these hormones where who knows what I'm going I'm getting? And I think it's going to take us back in time to where trans women and trans people in in general are finding these back alley surgeons and having these unhealthy procedures to try to affirm our gender. And so I think all in, all around, yes, it's going to be worse for trans people, but just women in general. And I think that we have to do something. I don't know what. Um, we have to do something to try to hold on to the rights that we have before they're taken as well. So, Yvonne, is uh, Massachusetts ready to be the Canada uh, as in a part of a new kind of underground railroad as um, the kinds of folks that Chastity's talking about and then uh, women of color from other states try to make their way here to a state that for now, at least, uh, offers the protections uh, for women seeking abortion access? Well, one, we, we certainly are better off than many other states in terms of access and availability, but, but by no means are we ready for what's coming. First of all, because we don't know the implications of crossing state lines, decriminalization elements, how that is going to uh, really play out is yet to be seen. So there could be providers who simply do not want to serve women from out of state because of the uncertainty surrounding the legal consequences. But even if we stay with the landscape here in Massachusetts, there are simply not enough providers as it is. I mean, we've all seen how fragile the healthcare system has been during the pandemic. The reproductive justice space is no exception. And so just in terms of the number of of providers, we don't have enough. And we also have some laws in the books that are actually not ideal, like parental consents for uh, for some younger uh, people who need access to this type of reproductive justice um, services. And we also have other, uh, which was alluded by some of our panelists, periods of gestation. And so, so we already have some, some, some pretty strict uh, guardrails in Massachusetts, I would say. And so we need to revisit some of that to determine how we can become the beacon that you're alluding to, Kelly, which, which I think is critical. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's also really important to underscore here that we need to be extraordinarily vigilant about how we go about organizing our day-to-day lives with the landscape, the risk of criminalization. It is really important to get legal advice, especially if you're in a state where these trigger laws are, are, are starting to pop up. It's, it's critical to have legal assistance as you go through this process, um, which, which is just terribly sad to say, uh, but, but that is where we are right now. Um, Renee, would you add to that? Land- Landers. Yes. Um, so I think that Yvonne is correct that even though the situation in Massachusetts is, is much better for residents of the state than it is in other parts of the country, there are still some limitations. There are still some areas of the state where uh, there are no providers to provi- that um, you know make available access to certain reproductive health care services. And so um, you know a lot of organizations have been trying to address those you know deserts. Uh, reproductive health care deserts for some time, but that's still a work in progress. Second, uh, we could do some things in our state laws to make it more difficult for um, people from these states that allow private citizens to sue and to track you across the country if you're seeking abortion rights. We need to uh, amend our statutes here to make our courts inhospitable to those claims, to try to protect our citizens and our health care providers. So that is one concrete thing that the state legislature and the governor could do to um, uh, to make uh, sure that we continue to have access here and are able to help people uh, from other states who want to travel here and receive services. Um, the Supreme Court, um, you know, Yvonne talked about you know reliance interests and you know being able to rely on the certainty of the law. Um, the Supreme Court 
uh, in the Alito leaked draft opinion, he said, oh, well, you know, the row kind of unsettled, um, you know, the legal landscape and has caused controversy. Um, they don't even understand what controversy they've unleashed because there will be um, all of this litigation about, um, you know, the intersection between different state laws uh, and following people. If someone sends, um, you know, abortion medication to, into a state, um, is the Commerce Clause, the federal power, preemptive power of federal law going to control? Or are we going to say, oh, well, the federal government's power stops at that state border? We don't know the answers to these questions, and it puts people, um, people's health and their legal rights um, at extreme peril. And the final thing I will say is that, you know, there's been a whole lot of controversy recently about, you know, the relationship between uh, some of these states uh, with these kind of draconian ideas about regulating people's private lives and their relationships with the corporations who employ people. Uh, and um, the corporations are going to have to deal with these issues as well, because, you know, what kinds of health insurance programs can they offer? What kinds of additional um, support can they give to employees uh, from some of these states? Um, and then the final thing I will say is on this access to health care services, um, I am, it could go in one of two ways. Um, you know, if I'm in medical school now and I'm thinking about, you know, do I want to be an obstetrician gynecologist or do I want to do something else uh, and where would I like to live, right? Um, so why would I enter this field, um, which is so fraught? Uh, you've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on your education and, and one, you know, uh, disagreement about your interpretation of the health necessity of a, of a medical procedure could uh, subject you to criminal liability and you could lose your license. Um, so why go into that field? And um, on the one and on the one hand, and then second, more why would you locate to one of these states that's going to regulate procedures in this way? This is going to be terribly undermining of the availability of reproductive health care services um, across the board. And as Yvonne pointed out, um, they're already inadequate. Um, Chastity, you spoke about this a little bit before, but I just wanted to uh, recognize that you had mentioned there's 240 bills already in process in Massachusetts that um, challenge uh, trans uh, people as it is. So now with this on top of it, does that accelerate that bill? I mean, are you, would you agree with Yvonne that, you know, there, maybe there's some guardrails, but, but Massachusetts is no panacea at this moment. Yes, Callie. So it's actually 240 bills across the United States. Okay, thank you. Um, not just in Massachusetts. That would have been, that would be a lot. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> what this does is it gives those bills more light for the people who put them in place. Um, and when you think about Roe versus Wade, something that's been in effect, you know, I grew up knowing how it came in effect and why it was so important these new rulings that's happened over the past 20 years are out of the window. And so I feel like most of these bills will be passed and they are limiting LGBTQ youth in certain aspects of their lives, whether that is the bathroom that they use at school or the sports that they wanna play that aligns with their gender that they represent. And this is just the beginning. I, I truly feel that, like Ivan said, and there's no consistency among these states. So why is it now that I could have my gender marker change here without having any gender affirming procedures. But if I go to Texas, I have to have every procedure performed, documentation of each procedure in order for my gender marker on my ID to yeah. be changed. That's something that should be federal, should be consistent across every state. Right. So again, back to what Renee is saying, like trans people, we have to decide like, where do I wanna live? What's gonna be safe for me? Are there laws that protect me? Like I'm not protected in Florida the way I'm protected here in Massachusetts. Right. So I would never move to Florida, even if a good job opportunity presented itself to me. So it, I think it, it makes us pivot as people, our own wants and dreams um, to live in this country. Okay. Renee Graham, you're gonna get, um, give a little runway to get the last word on this because I saw your face when, as we learned together that the ruling had come down, felt like a gut punch. Um, and so I, I'd like you to address that and also just speak to whether you see, how you see Massachusetts um, as a limited kind of Canada to a new underground railroad, a railroad, or something else. 
Well, you know, I, I think Chastity has, has spoken quite well to this. People in Massachusetts cannot get comfortable. It's not like people in Massachusetts can look and say, well, you know, we're not Texas, we're not Louisiana, we're okay. We're kind of okay, but probably in a limited sort of way because the people who have spent decades trying to overturn Roe v. Wade see daylight now. And so it's not just going to stop in, you know, those red states with those terrible governors. It's going to continue through the country. They're going to continue to agitate to undermine rights in states like Massachusetts and New Jersey and Connecticut and New York, where there are better laws on the books, but it also isn't perfect. What happened today is an absolute catastrophe. And, you know, I thought it was very interesting that Yvonne brought up the idea of the Fugitive Slave Act and what that means and that even, you know, the idea of having slave states and free states, but of course the Fugitive State uh, Slave Act kind of erased the whole line between that. And if you were a runaway, you were subjected to being returned to a plantation. That's a kind of, I feel like we can head in that direction. Mm. It, it's, you know, it is astonishing to me that we're talking about a law that was on the books for almost 50 years that's, Five people decided needed to be eliminated, and it is going to have an absolutely catastrophic effect on millions of people, and Thank not just women. Thank you so much, Renee. That's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. I want to thank you all for joining us. And now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We're on Facebook and YouTube with our post show. Continue our discussion on Roe v. Wade. Um, uh, you, you sort of uh, led us to the, uh, the emotional piece of this, uh, of uh, Renee Graham. I didn't get a chance to ask uh, a little bit chastity. You brought that up. But uh, Renee Landers and Yvonne, maybe you would like to weigh in on just yeah. the impact of it emotionally. Either one of yeah, you can start. I, I, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. And and yeah, like Renee was saying, frankly, the the imagery of the fugitive slave laws is what I've been thinking about the most, and the dangers that that presents through all of its elements: the element of criminalization, the element of the destruction of personhood, the commandeering of of state resources, even the uh, essentially. Uh, evisceration of protections that may exist at the local level that uh, that because of this notion of full faith and credit, which actually Professor Landers is alluding to, uh, how is that going to work out um, in terms of us respecting um, a request to criminalize somebody who came for uh, for a procedure? And so that imagery is is quite powerful and and I think frankly, um, uh, alarmingly close to reality, a, a potential manifestation. And that is horrifying to me, um, emotionally devastating. And, and I also think there's an, an equally perverse uh, impact here. We normally think of courts as protecting rights, uh, even expanding rights. And here, it's quite the opposite. It's the court taking away rights. And so that has an emotional, an intellectual, a political uh, the impact in terms of the way that we perceive of the role of courts and the way that we perceive of individual liberty. Um, my rights appear to be conditional, appear to be something that could be taken away tomorrow, which is not the way we normally think about fundamental freedoms. Renee Landers? Uh, so I, I think these are all... Um, you know, excellent observations. I think that um, more fundamental, well, even a, a different point is that um, the, opin the Alito opinion um, shows profound disregard for the health and the uh, capacity, for the health of women and the capacity of women to make important decisions. 
Um, it's not as if women don't understand that if they have an abortion, they will not be, you know, they will not have a child. I mean, that is the whole point of the procedure. So women understand that. And this notion that women are somehow, um, you know, misguided, not thinking clearly about making this choice is very insulting and, you know, takes us back to, you know, the 18th century or before uh, in, in terms of how we think about uh, women's autonomy and their, um, their, you know, their ability to control their own lives. Um, I think also, um, you know, this disregard, as I, as I mentioned, for the health of women in this whole process is really quite, um, you know, quite um, devastating to think about. Um, the, uh, there were press reports yesterday of an American woman uh, who had, was on vacation in Malta. She was 16 weeks pregnant and she started suffering, you know, severe um, uh, uh, symptoms of a miscarriage. Uh, and Malta has an absolute ban on abortion with no exceptions whatsoever, which is what Oklahoma has just passed. And um, she finally, after some wrangling, had to be airlifted out of Malta to get the uh, procedures uh, to you know, finish the miscarriage, proce miscarriage process so that she would not have risks to her own health. Um, that is the situation we're going to be looking at. And I, I, I think that has to be very devastating for women. Um, who might become pregnant. Something that you said, um, you know, in leading up to this, this day that we're discussing it, was that you had a question that you would ask your students uh, with regard to um, the sort of anti-woman perspective, and you were shocked every year that, you know, they didn't seem to consider the woman. Would you explain? Um, yeah, I, I do think that... Um, uh, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you ask questions of students uh, and um, uh, in this, uh, uh, in, 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 in one of the questions, um, you know, I asked on my exam this year, there were very few students who actually um, introduced the concept of, you know, protecting a woman's health in response to, you know, answering this question about, in a, you know, a hypothetical abortion restriction, which it wasn't so hypothetical after all. Um, and so I think that um, because, you know, we've kind of gotten used to the idea of, you know, women's role in society having changed, you know, quite dramatically since the 1970s when Roe v. Wade was decided, that people are not really thinking that there is, that vulnerability remains there anymore. It's easy to kind of skate over that. And so, um, and I think that it's incumbent upon um, many of us to try to remind people that these are, um, you know, still real, um, uh, you know, there are still real constraints on women in society. And I was struck that nobody looked at the father as having any responsibility. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, my, my, my question was about, um, uh, you know, whether a state could require a woman, to, you know, to carry a child, to, uh, you know, a pregnancy to term and then actually have to take custody and raise the child. And no one, yes, no one said, oh, well, what about, very few students said, well, what about the father? <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think we're still in that era that this, this, all these things are women's responsibility. Contraception or women's responsibility is a woman's responsibility you know, taking care of these child, uh, you know, caregiving uh, responsibilities, those are women's responsibilities. We're still in that, that realm. And Renee Graham, uh, you had a dear friend who was caught in a situation similar to the woman that uh, Ren Renee Landers mentioned in Malta. Uh, yeah, this is probably almost 20 years ago now, but uh, a good friend of mine who was in her 40s and was pregnant and found out rather early in the pregnancy that um, she could not carry that child to term. And so she very reluctantly had to have an abortion. And she was worried about it because of her age, not knowing if she could get pregnant again. Under the current circumstances and the way things are happening in, in other states, she would not be able to do that and would have been in a position to be forced to carry a non-viable fetus to term knowing the child could not live. The impact that that would have had on her and would have had on those in her family would have been absolutely devastating. And so when people talk about these laws, they're not thinking about these circumstances, which frankly aren't that rare. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And, you know, the idea that she would have had to do that because someone else made this decision for her 
it's just the height of cruelty to me. And that's the thing that I think that sticks with me. It's just the depth of cruelty in these laws. And I, I just I also just want to mention, because I was thinking about this last night, uh, Amy Coney Barrett is 50. Neil Gorsuch is 54. Brett Kavanaugh is 57. They are going to be on this court for the next 25 to 30 years wrecking this country and undermining our rights. So that's where we are right now. And, and you know, how, it, there's, we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot we have to do to push against this because this is, you know, we're, we're, as, it's, as several people said already, it's a slippery slope at this point. Hmm. Well, one of the slippery slopes I wanted to mention to you all and get your response is, I don't think a lot of people understand that this ruling can, is already having an impact on, laws or regulations governing contraception, which would seem crazy. So if the point is that you don't want anybody to have an abortion, if that's your stance, if okay, why are you stopping contraception? I'm just not understanding how that all comes together. It seems to me that's the first line of prevention, which would allow, you know, could help reduce the numbers of abortion. Potentially. Well, and in fact, and in fact, it has, and that is why, until the last year, um, the rate of abortions in the United States has been declining quite precipitously over time. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, the access and the availability of really effective form. Not one hundred percent. Nothing is one hundred percent forms of contraception. Um, and so, um, the other aspect of this are the restrictions on sex education in schools. Accurate sex education schools beyond saying don't have sex and then pregnancy won't be an issue. This is obviously not realistic, has never worked uh, since time immemorial, as people have sex. So I think that the, um, the idea, the, the uh, goal of these laws is to um, you know, make sex, um, sting to stigmatize people having sex and to discourage sex outside of marriage uh, and uh, and to uh, you know make women bear continue to bear the stigma of those decisions about sexual activity. So it, I, I'm I'm not convinced that these decisions really at a root are about a respect for life, but they really are at a spec, uh, out of uh, controlling uh, you know the sexual activities of women and 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 other people. Um, Yvonne, I saw you um, nodding your head. Absolutely, it, it, you know I keep thinking about the hypothetical that Professor Landers shared, and she said people didn't think about the women's health. I mean, I want to be clear, men didn't think about the women's health. And so it is, it's moments like this, these type of developments, that really underscore the power of the patriarchy and how these decisions will continue to, to support that and foment that. And particularly during the pandemic, when we have seen so many women leave the workforce. You know, uh, we have, uh, by most estimates, uh, gone back at least a decade in women's participation in the workplace. And when you combine that reality, what's happening on the ground with the economy and the workforce, with a decision like Dobbs, you know, these two things compound each other and will exacerbate uh, the patriarchy and will exacerbate the uh, really the. Uh, the removal of women from the workplace in, in a way that is very problematic. And so I, I want to call that out. I mean, this, 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 is, uh, this is a problem men are creating. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's have some closing thoughts from you guys uh, in this way. Um, the ruling has happened. And so now my question to you is, how, what are the steps that each of you are looking at that might be taken to... I don't know, push back is, is, is seems a weak expression against the Supreme Court ruling, but um, um, to sort of, uh, you know, figure out ways to protect those who are now unprotected, I guess is the best way to do it. And I'm going to start with you, Chastity. Thank you, Carly. I think for me, it goes back to two things. One with something that Professor Landers said and Renee Graham said. So Professor Landers, you alluded that most of these people on the Supreme Court are gonna be here for the next 25, 30 years, which is a problem. And Renee, you say that we have a lot of work to do. So I think we need to figure out what is the work that needs to be done in order for us to figure out how can we change this whole system where 
Congress and Supreme Court has the say over our livelihood. And I know that is a, a big task, but I think that we need to start at our local and state level as usual, because if we have, we're putting these people in office, these representatives, these mayors, these governors, we're putting them in office. And so if they are not going to be for the betterment of our lives, and especially for women's rights, then we need to get them out of office. And I think that is the only way that we're going to be able to slowly get to make change at the federal level, especially on the Supreme Court, because we need a change. Um, I'm sorry if you are been in this position or in the Supreme Court for more than 30 years, times have changed. So we can't have people who have this 1960 thinking ideation over the country in 2023, 2024. Okay. And I just think that we have a lot of work to do as a country. Um, Renee Landers, I know you're working with uh, something called Beyond Row. What, what's uh, the maybe the first response you have now? Right. So I would agree with what Chastity said, right, that um, uh, no local office is uh, insignificant in this um, in the long game here, um, which is how the uh, abortion opponents have succeeded. Um, you know, the person who's on the school committee today or, you know, is on the planning board today um, may be the governor in five or 10 years, right? And so um, it's very important uh, to know and understand how they think about these issues when we're supporting them or deciding not to support them. Um, and so I, I, I do think that that is very important. I do think also uh, that we have to, um, you know, that one of the structural problems in our democracy is the Senate, is the way the Senate is configured to give equal representation to the state. So a state like Wyoming, you know, with barely a million people, I don't think even has a million people, um, you know, has the same representation in the Senate as, uh, you know, a state like California, which has 50 million people, right? Um, and that is what leads to the ability to control these Supreme Court appointments and, uh, you know, uh, decline to, you uh, confirm uh, President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland to the court and then, you know, wait it out. And therefore, now we have, um, you know, a series of appointments to the Supreme Court, which are lacking uh, seriously in political legitimacy because of the way they happen. Amy Comey Barrett, you know, a weeks before the 2020 election, right? So I think, um, you know, we need to give, so, you know, I'm, I'm not hopeful about a constitutional amendment, but I am hopeful about the possibility of being able to perhaps put some term limits on the Supreme Court um, so that, um, you know, that at least, um, you know, people aren't, you know, sort of sitting there, um, you know, for, for decades and decades um, and, um, you know, uh, imposing uh, really retrograde uh, views on the rest of the country. Renee Graham. You know, if this is if this is going to be a states' rights issue and it's become one now, then it's very important for the states to shore up their laws, to, to enhance those laws, um, to make sure that they what's happened today won't intrude on how they protect their citizens and their rights. Um, I also think it's just really important for those who believe in civil rights, who believe in reproductive rights, to take back the narrative from conservatives. What would happen is that people would say, oh, they have purity tests, and oh, this person isn't on their side. That's irrelevant. These are not about purity tests. These are about people's rights and protecting them. So I think, you know, people who are, you know, I use the term loosely, but liberals have to figure out a way to have those conversations and to talk about rights and not be cowed by what conservatives do. Stop allowing conservatives to drive the conversation and stop pretending like your rights cannot be taken away. We now understand there is really no such thing as settled law in this country, and we need to behave accordingly. Yvonne, last, last word. We have known for years that the court is conservative. The court has always been conservative, even with different compositions. It doesn't reflect what the majority of Americans want to see, and most certainly not what progressive Americans want to see. I am not completely discouraged by Dobbs. I think we just need to think even more creatively, even more nuanced about how we structure our arguments, about how we structure our cases to continue to have federal courts as viable venues for individual rights and for civil rights. And so we are not giving up the fight. We are getting ready because it is going to happen even here in Massachusetts. And at Lawyers for Civil Rights, we will represent and protect anybody 
who needs access to reproductive justice. That is a commitment that is deeply embedded in our history and tradition. Thank you all so much for joining me.